Sasha. She'll be leading the Q&A session right after this. Uh, just a quick summary of what JHR does. It's an international media development organization focused on mobilizing citizens and communities through human rights oriented media. And Amnesty McGill is the school's chapter of Amnesty International, an international NGO that promotes human rights through research, campaigning, and demonstrations. Thank you all for coming out tonight despite the weather. Uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded for CKUT and JHR uh, TV, so if you could keep phones off, I should do that actually. Um, and just, you can get cupcakes and tea, just try to keep the shuffle down to a minimum. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful panel of speakers. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, we have Reverend Neil Whitehouse, McGill's oh, ecumenical chaplain. He was ordained by the British Methodist Church in 1992. He's worked in international and national youth work, local London churches, and founded a spiritual and social well-being center in London, serving lesbians, gay men, and their friends with a multi-faith approach. He joined McGill's chaplaincy in 2010 and is a representative of the United Church of Canada and the Anglican Church of Canada. Next, we have Dr. Julie Norman, who is in the Department of Political Science. She teaches courses on the Arab-Israeli conflict, Middle Eastern foreign policy, and human rights. She is the author of two books on unarmed resistance in Israel and Palestine, and she has also published on media activism, legal advocacy, and urban planning in the Middle East. And last but not least, we have John Wayne, who teaches a course on religion and human rights and leads a human rights module in religion and globalization. His, re his research is focused on the contemporary language of rights and how that translates into justice for children. Other areas of interest include Christian ethics, political theology, and political theory. So we've divided the evening into a series of very general topics that we'll only brush on this very complex and general issue. Um, but time is short and we're running a little late, so I'm going to get started. Firstly, a UN resolution in 2009 declared that the defamation of religion is a human rights violation. The main criticism of this resolution is that it can be used to justify censorship in Muslim countries. My question to you is, is the defamation of religion a human rights violation? Do we have a right to not be offended? Um, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll start with that. Um, first, I'd just like to thank uh, Amnesty International and JHR for organizing the event, and also Neil and John for being here, and all of you for coming out, especially at this very busy time of year. So it's great to see everyone. Um, in terms of this question, and, uh, and yeah, this question of do we have a right to not be offended, I would actually argue the opposite in the sense that I think what human rights does best is protect the right to be offended in the sense that um, in, in, in literal human rights terms, you have a right to a, a freedom of conscience and a freedom of thought. And so the way that you interpret what's going on around you and have that right to be offended and to respond to it, you also have rights that protect your ability to take action or to mobilize or to form groups in response to other things. But I think a right to not be offended um, just on a certain pragmatic level would be extremely hard to define um, and, uh, and to implement. And I also think on a more conceptual level, it would, be, it would be dangerous to try and protect ourselves from that. I think where most creative thought and where most, where most creative activism happens is when people are offended and they're moved to take some kind of action. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll also say thank you for having me and it's a pleasure to uh, speak on a panel with you, Julie and Neil. Um, I mean, it's a complex issue as uh, we've seen, especially in global news with the cartoon crisis. Um, so, you know, there, there's a part of it where we have to ask, you know, we can ask, in a sense, the mundane question of do we have a right to be offended or, or this issue of offense. But what we can see, uh, especially recently with the, uh, with the YouTube movie and uh, with Terry Jones and his burning of Koran and different things, is that, you know, these almost, uh, well, these thoughtless actions uh, by some can have deathly consequences for others. So it's, it's an issue that we have to take very seriously um, and that we have to think about very seriously. Now, uh, I think a part of what it raises is it complexifies uh, the language of rights a little bit in that we can tend to think of rights strictly as entitlements. 
And uh, this helps us to think a little bit deeper than that, in that entitlements also entail duties. And that's a difficulty for us in our use, in, in, I would say, in a very highly westernized, individualized use of the language of rights. We don't like to think about the duty side of it so much. Whereas when you get out of, uh, outside of the Western world, uh, you know, the, the only language of, of justice you have is a language of duty. And so there's a bit of a clash there. But I think it's, a, it's an important reminder. So I, in a sense, I'd like to turn the question around and, and uh, say, you know, do we have a duty to be sensitive you know, to these things? And I would say someone like, like Terry Jones in Florida had a, had a huge duty to turn his brain on and be sensitive to some of the things that he was engaging and didn't, and, and others paid for their lives uh, with that. Um, so it, it, in, in, I would say the question complexifies that. It's not to, I mean, there's, there's, I mean we could have just had the whole night discussing this one topic. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, issues to be raised there. Um, and not the least of which, uh, you know, when you, when you do have these issues, say in a country like Pakistan, where uh, you have people accused of blasphemy, um, you know, how do you find justice for those who are, are uh, uh, accused of this and face a very grave penalty for something that, you know, especially coming from Western mindset where, you know, get a pail, put urine in it and put a crucifix in it and somebody says that's art, right? Uh, you know, you've, you've got a Western mindset that doesn't think the same way about offense like that. So I guess my short answer, it's a very complex issue that's going to take a lot of, of work to, to work through. Thank you, Julie and John. I'm, I'm very grateful for your answers and uh, very pleased to be here. Um, none of us are neutral about religion and uh, spirituality. None of us. Uh, and I think... Being a journalist, there's a bit of a clash always at work between the neutrality that, that is demanded apparently in your presentation of a story and what your own subjective views are. And behind this question uh, is the question of religious offence and what is it to be religious. And, um, Knowing that many of the students at McGill, the atmosphere is not very religious, it's difficult to imagine for many what, what that is like. Uh, so, uh, something at, at play here is are, are about core human values. The offense is, is uh, live and real because what people take to be themselves has been attacked in terms of their, their life as a religious person. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave you. Great. Um, building on that, I'd like to bring up a rather famous example from this year, the jailing of the members of the Russian band Pussy Riot. For those who are unfamiliar, the members of the band were sentenced to two years in prison for writing songs that criticized the church and Putin. They were accused of inciting religious hatred. The Russian constitution technically protects both freedom of religion and freedom of speech. And I think it's fair to say that the government chose to override freedom of speech in this particular case. Uh, I just wanted to hear your reaction on that. And also I have a question. What are some ways in which governments can justify censorship, particularly in regards to governments that claim to value freedom of speech? I'll wait in first this time, I guess. Um, now, I. I uh, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not very familiar with the music of Pussy Riot or uh, deeply engaged uh, with the case. Uh, so I think the comment I would probably make first of it is a little bit of a historical comment that has some contemporary relevance. And I would want to question how much their jailing has to do necessarily with freedom of religion and how much it has to do with politics. Um, and uh, I, I would suggest that perhaps it has a lot more to do with Putin than with the church. Uh, but I think that also we need to look back in history and, and gain some, some lessons there too. Uh, John Rawls, who you may or may not be familiar with uh, in writing his uh, political liberalism, um, the introduction to the paperback version has a lot to say about the wars of religion uh, after the Reformation. Um, but you know, some might argue that's a bit of a misnomer as well. Certainly religion had a huge role in that society and it was a, a big factor, but were these wars of religion so much as they were wars of territory? Um, you know, and even uh, 
if you uh, take a look at uh, Trudeau's The Treason of the New Intellectuals, uh, you know, one of the things he does in, is looking at, you know, life since Westphalia and uh, arguing that, you know, we've got a lot more bloodshed with the nation state, the secularized nation state. Um, and, and so I, I guess all of that is to say sometimes we, we uh, maybe give religion too high of a role in these conflicts and maybe need to recognize that religion, uh, and this is something Mark Yurtz Meyer, who some of the students here would be familiar with, uh, would talk about and say that religion uh, actually often serves to complexify conflict. Uh, it's not necessarily the root of it. It's not to say it isn't sometimes the root of it or it can be the root of it, but uh, I think we need to maybe sometimes recognize some of the distinctions here. Yeah, I just echo what John said. The the pussy riot arrests in particular were definitely more political, um, and I, I would say that in two ways. First, Pussy Riot themselves, for those who have followed this case closely, uh, are an activist group as well as a music group, and they were very intentional about about planning that particular event and other activism. So this wasn't just a, a music group that was doing a concert that was critical and some they were arrested. They, they knew that was very likely and that that was possible and that, that it was an intentionally provocative act. Um, their arrest has rightly so gotten a lot of media attention, but uh, many within the human rights community are somewhat are, are glad for that attention, but at the same time noting that many other activists within Russia have also been silenced, arrested, disappeared, what have you, in the last year as well, and have not received that attention. So again, just to echo, this was more of a, a political uh, reason, and I think what's interesting is how the state kind of brought in the religious piece more. And I think this gets to your second question of how is censorship justified. And it's true, I mean, even certain human rights documents has a limitation that it can be curbed to protect public order, security, health, and I think even the morals of others. So it has kind of this, uh, uh, this slight disclaimer at the end to it. Um, and I think states have picked up on that language, not just from that one document, but from other places as well, and use that as a justification for censorship, as well as many other kinds of human rights abuses. That, that commitment to maintaining the public order allows states to get away with a lot. I see it as rather a prophetic, active prophecy it's called, and in some ways you could say it is the combination of, uh, of spirituality and religious belief of a sort, uh, and politics, and they chose very well, and uh, they action, reaction, they've got what they gave, you know, and it's sad for them, and sad in its reflection on the state of Russia that, that has happened, but it, it was, to my mind, a spiritual as well as political action. Um. Thank you. Uh, my final question on the media portion of tonight is regarding the Dutch politician, excuse my pronunciation, Gert Wilders, I want to say. He campaigned for a book ban on the Quran in 2009, claiming that it qualifies as hate speech. He also considers himself an advocate for, freedom, for free speech. Is a clash between freedom of religion and freedom of press inevitable? And are there examples where the two values preside harmoniously? And can they even reinforce each other? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, go ahead, Jane. Um, just look, I, yeah, the. I'll start with more your second question, I guess. Is the clash inevitable? Um, I definitely don't think so. Um, if anything, I think groups like JHR, Freedom House, other groups that really push for uh, you know, watchdogs on censorship and, and for, for openness that um, are, are also protecting other freedoms, and that includes freedom of religion. And so in most cases, I think, or in many cases, you see the press or press advocacy groups actually creating spaces for more freedoms, and that includes freedom of religion. Um, in this case, with, with the Dutch um, uh, uh, classifying the, the Quran as hate speech, again, this classification of hate speech is somewhat dangerous in itself, and I come from the States, and that's uh, the, the concept of hate speech even more so there uh, is very there's kind of a critical approach to that with what could you actually put in that category and even if you put something there does that make it illegal um, in the states it's not illegal to um, you know deny the holocaust or certain other things that are illegal in Europe or in Canada and for many people that does seem 
uh, wrong. And I think, as John said, the duty side would suggest that we have a duty to not do those things. But in terms of a right, you still have the right to say whatever you want. And in, in terms of classifying anything as hate speech, again, I would, um, I would hope that most of the Dutch population would not see the Quran as hate speech. Um, and I believe there has been a response to that attempted classification. And I think that's more of, that's more where you see the, the, the power of free speech coming through is how people respond to extremist statements like that. With that said, uh, he has a right to say that, but, uh, but I, I don't think a right to ban it on those grounds. Some of these uh, issues are arising uh, out of globalization and an increase in contact between people and cultures. Um, most of us know something about the religious backgrounds, ide ideas, practices of the communities in which we grew up in. And it's the exposure to thoughts, practices around the world in a much more intense way than ever before, thanks to technology, thanks to travel, that we're confronted with new problems. And the language uh, issues of thinking through all this complexity, uh, uh, in a sense it's the product of our time, that they're, they're somewhat new and, and thoughtful. I think with both of these two, when you're talking about freedom of religion and freedom of the press, there are constituencies attached to both. And I think those constituencies have, have, uh, have some duties there as well. So the duty to expect our journalists to uh, to report, you know, and, and to report thoughtfully and to report deeply, uh, an expectation that our uh, our religious leaders, our religious teachers, uh, would think deeply and uh, would be, and that both would be deeply committed in those areas. So I, I think a part of it, you know, when you have somebody who makes, you know, who makes some comments like this, uh, the constituents constituency needs to press them to justify and support uh, those things, uh, whether it's now whether it's in the religious sphere or in the public sphere of the press. I think I just can't, when I, my opening remarks was about how lack of contact with religion leads us on to the, some of these questions, in that uh, the, the quality that one should expect of religious thought and practice uh, would make it ridiculous that someone would take a sacred text and call it hate speech. It's, um, so some of this is about us and you as potential actual media people uh, not engaging in your own uh, journey as to who you are, what you believe, what your faith and what your spirituality is, which would mean each of us has more of a resource to address uh, extreme statements when they're clearly out of order. In line with these comments, Christopher Hitchens famously said that Islamophobia is a fake term, that aspects of Islam should produce a rational fear. He thinks the Western world is overly obsessed with political correctness, while Islamic countries are allowed to propagate hate towards others. Do you think that Islam is treated differently, that it is exempt from legitimate criticism, and who establishes the boundary between criticism and hatred? Sure, I. But <laughs> we need to pull numbers to take chances. I know. <laughs> um, you know, I would say on one hand that uh, you could certainly look at instances and say that is, uh, you know, Islam appears to be uh, exempt. From legitimate criticism in some in some ways because of the way people handle situations, but it would you could also look at the last ten years and say that Muslims have been deprived of an accurate uh, portrayal, uh, whether in the media or you know when you think of, of uh, you know the post 9/11 world, uh, you know at first all of Islam was just lumped together with Al Qaeda, and there was never I shouldn't say never but there there. What's happened since then has been a lot of research, a lot of dialogue, and uh, you know, a much deeper understanding, uh, and not just you know at very particular levels, but you know something that's disseminated more publicly, so that there's a, a better public understanding. So I, I think there's the two sides to that. I think I think uh, uh, 
you know, there certainly is a sensitivity. I mean, whenever you, you talk about religion and human rights, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to start talking about Islam at some point. Um, and uh, I think there is a definitely a heightened sensitivity around the, the discussion. Um, I, I think one way of, of uh, I would justify that a bit is this, this deprived sense of an accurate portrayal um, as well. So in answer to the first question, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think there should be an exemption. I think there is sometimes, and I think sometimes there's a thoughtful sensitivity behind some of that. Uh, who establishes the boundary uh, between criticism and hatred? Um, you know, it's pretty, uh, it, it, it comes when the raw nerves are, are exposed in a lot of ways. Uh, I remember driving in my car uh, in September of 2001 uh, following the, the attacks and uh, I remember listening to CBC radio and, and you know hearing different people calling in and you know this one person just said look we need to track down the, uh, the relatives, the children, the, I mean every possible location and kill these people. You know I mean this was the raw uh, response and we've been living in the history of some of that raw response. Um, but I, I think a lot of the dialogue is, has helped so that hopefully it's not the raw nerves that are, that are uh, defining the boundaries, but some reasoned dialogue. Yeah, I would, I would echo that as well. And I think kind of what, uh, what Neil was saying a moment ago, too, about what we're exposed to, I think in terms of drawing the line between criticism and hatred, I think usually criticism emerges when people are well informed on an area or an issue and are intentionally analytical, rational, critical and exploring it and pointing out its uh, its challenges, its complexities, its, its criticisms, whereas uh, when there is an ignorance, when there's a lack of knowledge, I think that's where you see the emotional response and that's where you see more of the hatred response to that. Um, in the case of Islam in particular, I. I don't think Islam or any religion or faith or spiritual background is, is exempt from criticism um, uh, at all, but, but again, not just Islam, Christianity and, and others as well. Um, I, again, because we're in North America, I think that Islam has been getting more, uh, has been more criticized here and especially in the United States than other religions. Um, again, being in the States for the last decade, uh, you know, from 2001 through last year, uh, the rhetoric as well as the actions as well as um, public opinion towards Islam and towards Muslims is uh, is negative. I mean, there's there's no other way to say it. And again, there has been many groups, many individuals who have tried to to temper that and to uh, to challenge it. But the general mindset, at least in the U.S. right now, um, there there is a bias, and uh, and I've, I've I've witnessed that. Yeah. A colleague of mine, even with with the the Sikh temple shooting, you know, part of the media response, you know, part of it was to say, oh, he mistook this group, uh, you know. So, so I mean, you can see, you can see the the bias coming through there, um, you know, and, and some of the key concerns mm -hmm. that raises. Yeah, just, I mean, just one other very small addition to that during the Obama campaign, both his campaigns that. The campaign had to be so intentional to show that Obama was not a Muslim. Like, God forbid, if he was, you know, it was like, oh my gosh. But like, it, they were so intentional on on having to prove that because that was just it was equated with with very negative connotations for most of the U.S. and that was that was problematic for me and many other human rights people. In a vacuum of experience, where we're vulnerable, chaplaincy offers visits to places of. Uh, sacred places around Montreal. Actually, this evening, a group of students are going to a Sikh Gurdwara. When you know your neighbor, then you'll have a sense of uh, the intention behind a statement. Uh, if it's criticism, I think there is some hope for constructive outcome of the criticism. When it's hatred, there's a carelessness to the consequences. Um, so come visit some of the the places around Montreal. Thank you. One of the main criticisms of human rights in general is that it's a completely Western idea, Western conception, that ignores the nuanced religious and cultural values of other parts of the world. Do you agree with this idea, and how can other traditions, particularly in less developed areas of the world, be incorporated into this dialogue? 
Um, this is a question that in my human rights class we actually uh, look at pretty closely and grapple with. Um, I did think there definitely is an association of Western bias with human rights and coming out of primarily Western institutions, but the actual legal document that we use for universal human rights uh, was informed by multiple uh, cultures, nationalities, religious groups. There was a very intentional attempt at that time to, to get a sense of the moral and ethical understandings of different religions. And so there was kind of this uh, a survey, if you will, of, of kind of people going back and trying to talk to people in their own uh, in their own areas and, and try and find that common denominator of rights. And so, even though this, even though our, our human rights did emerge from from Western institution, I would argue that they are informed by multiple worldviews and multiple religious codes and multiple uh, uh, moral codes. Um, I think what we've also seen is the way those rights are interpreted is more of where you see the differentiation. And there is a difference in different religious interpretations of those rights. But the core rights themselves, I don't think are quite as, uh, you know, Western as, as they're often pegged to be. I like that answer. I've learned something. It gives me hope, really. Uh, when I was studying theology, theology I did a, a, a paper on self and salvation and, and it looked at at least three different religions and you had a sense there in which it's really very rich what religions, different religions have, have uh, discovered in their own terms about what is a self, what is a person and they aren't the same and yet there are overlaps and uh, you, you reassure me that some work was done to find some common ground and to frame it in different language, uh, so um, both and is what okay. I'm saying. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll agree, but but put a probably a little more of a conflictual bent on it too. I mean, the the drafting committee for the UHR, led by Jacques Maritain, a uh, uh, Catholic uh, philosopher. Uh, I mean, a part of what they were attempting to do was get this overlapping consensus. Right? And Maritime famously you know, said, look, we can agree on the norms as long as we don't ask why. Right? So it's, it's in the why where we start to have arguments and we can't agree and we can't get along. Uh, now Maritime himself, in Man and the State, uh, a book he wrote uh, later, uh, I mean, for him, uh, human rights had a natural law foundation and grounding. Uh, but in the document, in EDHR, this, this uh, aspirational document you have, uh, it was the pursuit there was this this overlapping consensus, uh, this idea that we can agree on norms, but we can justify those norms from our own perspectives, whether it's a philosophical perspective or, or a religious perspective or, or whatever perspective we can do that to. Now, conceptually, uh, so here, and here's where where uh, you know rights get their their distinctly Western, in fact, distinctly Christian bent is that. You know, conceptually, this language comes out of theology, uh, comes out of uh, what some refer to as the first great rights movement, being the freedom of the church, the Catholic church, pushing off the monarchy, um, to say that, that we have, you know, uh, rights in our own as, as the church that the state can't interfere with. Uh, it also comes from, you know, passing through what some would refer to as the second great rights movement, the Protestant Reformation, where there's an individualization of these things. Uh, and then, of course, they've, they've passed through the, the grid of the Enlightenment um, and, uh, and different thinkers there. But the conceptual roots, uh, you know, Jean Gerson is, is the theologian who's first working with this idea of a subjective right, that, that's something that is, is uh, you know, belongs to the individual. Um, but he's, even there, he's working within a framework of, you know, any right that I have or that you have or that someone else has itself is subject to, uh, so he's, if we're going to use right in the plural, rights, we're going to talk about rights that each of us have, um, he's saying those are all subject to right itself. Um, so all, all that is to, is to, is to say there's, uh, certainly when we talk about contemporary human rights, uh, these are something that the, the uh, drafting committee uh, and the, sorry, the philosophers committee before the drafting committee worked hard to make something that we could universalize and all agree upon. Um, the conceptual language of that that's being used, though, this, this rights language is something that does have, have deep roots. And, uh, and when it's criticized as being very Western and liberal and maybe even Christian, we kind of have to say, 
it, it, yeah, it, it has its roots there. Great. Um, the next set of questions is more or less geared towards you all individually, but I'd love to hear everyone's input. Uh, the first is for Professor Wayne. The Council of Europe said in 2007 that they were worried about the possible ill effect of the spread of creationist ideas within our education systems and about the consequences for our democracies. If we are not careful, creationism could become a threat to human rights. I'd like to hear a response to this statement, and I ask, does religious education that teaches creationism reach the rights of children, and how do children's rights fit into the framework of religion? Okay. Um, I guess my first answer to that would be, you know, to question, well, what do we mean by children's rights? Uh, when you look at the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it does something very interesting uh, in that uh, children's rights, as far as agreements go, you know, I think the first agreement we'd say is the 1924 Geneva Declaration, which uh, really you could generalize and say it's focused on provisions for children. Then we can look to, you know, you've got the UDHR in 1948, but then in 1959 you have the Declaration of the Rights, uh, of, the rights of the Child from the UN. And uh, having, you know, with history of, of uh, the Holocaust and World War coming through, you have a real focus on protection, okay? With the CRC in 1989, uh, you have something new brought to the table, and that's participation rights. Uh, now, the CRC affirms provisions and protections, but it adds this idea of participation as well, which is speaking to agency. Now, when we talk about rights, a lot of the, you know, sometimes the language of rights itself gets narrowed to being just a language of agency, right? It's a language that lets me do what I want to do. Um, and sometimes I think it, it does that at the expense of dependency. Uh, now with children, provision and protection rights especially recognize dependency. Uh, participation rights uh, should and can, but a lot of the times the way we use them, I think they, they end up prioritizing agency over dependency. Certainly uh, Martha Nisbaum, when, when she looks at uh, using her capabilities approach as a way of uh, of giving a theoretical basis to children's rights, uh, she's, she's looking for agency to be the priority there. Uh, so, back to your question, you know, does religious education that teaches creationism breach the rights of children? My, uh, part of my question in return would be, well, which rights are we talking about? If it's their uh, agency rights, um, you know, part of what we ask, what do we mean by that? What, what agency do they necessarily need? Uh, in regards to their education. A part of it is children, children are, uh, they're coming from somewhere, <laughs> right? Uh, they all have uh, a background and, and the background they have is not chosen. There's no child that can conceive of their own life. They receive it, but they can't conceive of it themselves. Um, so so they're, they're getting something that they didn't choose to begin with. Um, now the the question of whether creationism itself does that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more of an advocate of uh, parents having a choice as far as, as what they are going to teach their children. Uh, I think a part of the parental duty is to teach your child to think and to teach your child to uh, be able to uh, maneuver their way thoughtfully through this world. Um, but I wouldn't be a big fan of, of uh, uh, telling parents Will, Will Kimlicka puts it in terms of you know, the state sticking its nose into every nook and cranny of life. Uh, and, and when you get to something, you know, if parents are going to teach creation to their children or if they're going to teach evolution to their children, usually you're getting to some core, poorly held belief in that family's, uh, family's worldview. And I'm not sure how deeply the state should, uh, should mess with that. Uh, now, there's a lot of people that disagree with me and say that the state has a huge interest in that and should, uh, should you know, take over in that area. Uh, that's not the perspective that I would take. I think, I think that uh, we need to uh, let the family do some of its core work in those areas and let the family's interaction with the broader world uh, do some work there too. It's, that's a loaded, loaded question, loaded answer. Uh, there's a lot you'd have to unpack with that, but I think that would be my root answer is we need to Unless the family is, is, is uh, struggling, uh, and to a very great degree, I'm not sure how far the state should stick its fingers in there, other than to support. Yeah, I just agree. This sense of, of, of 
of the who is, we talked about duty, but who is who is the duty bearer with some of these rights? And again, in this case, it's, it's kind of who is disseminating the, the education. And again, you would be, you would be violating certain other rights if you disallowed the teaching of creationism, um, you know, by parents or by churches or by, um, you know, by, by, by private groups. Um, but again, it, it, to me, it's a different if a state is saying our state education is only teaching creationism and you will also be punished if you try and teach anything else. Like that to me is where you get into a rights issue. But there's also certain rights protections that need to allow for that to be part of the conversation and again, allow kids to, to develop their own critical thinking to it. So, and again, with kids' with children's rights, you get very much tied to the parents' rights also. Um, and and it, gets, it gets, children's rights get very complicated, as uh, John can speak to much more than I can, but. But I think what you're saying, too, is important that, I mean, the state has oversight over curriculum mm -hmm. uh, issues, things like that. So, I mean, the state has an avenue for influencing uh, the, the education of the child um, and, and I think we're in agreement saying how far they should press that right. you know do you press that you know if you have an influence in in the public school but also in the public education as far as curriculum that can be expected of homeschool situations um, how far do you press that other than having that curriculum having that expectation I'm not sure you you press it much farther than that I'll go with all of that. You made me think of a, a, one of my favorite musicals, South Pacific. Uh, you, you have to be carefully taught by the age of six or seven or eight. You have to be carefully taught. And it's a song about racism, which uh, the, the, the American realizes is holding him back from marrying his, uh, his true love. But equally true in this, I don't think uh, education that teaches fundamentalism uh, is education. And this necessity of diversity is education, being carefully taught. Thank you. The next question is geared towards Reverend Whitehouse. Um, there is an anti-homosexuality bill on the table in Uganda, popularly known as the Kill the Gays bill. Uh, it was called a Christmas gift by their Speaker of Parliament. Essentially, it would criminalize same-sex relations in Uganda, and offenders could receive the death penalty. This bill was famously pushed by some evangelical groups in the U.S. It was also publicly denounced by the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church of Canada, and many other religious organizations. I'd like to ask you to describe the diversity of perspectives on gay rights within Christianity. How does this particular interpretation of gay rights receive so much leverage, and how much does it deviate from popular Christian thought? You're meaning the, the Ugandan bill? Yes. Itself. Well, I think the latest news is that uh, they've commuted at the death sentence to a long-term imprisonment. Right. Um, <laughs> killing somebody, uh, executing them, a capital offence, is the ultimate weapon of the state. So in some ways the argument must be that the person has tra transgressed in some fundamental way uh, what it is to be human, what it is to uh, be a, a person in society. And I think it's, it's, the argument would go uh, uh, about a corrupting influence and even a dangerous influence in, uh, if you label that uh, all gay people carry AIDS, for example. Um, scapegoating. Um, I see it, that particular bill much more political than than uh, religious, and it's inevitably mi mixed up in Uganda, the, the Christian profile and, and the political one. A uh, follow-up question that might deviate a little from the religious side, but uh, for the whole panel, is there any kind of international intervention that can affect or prevent this kind of legislation, and is cutting off aid from countries an effective strategy of combating intolerance? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on this. The Uganda bill has, has been in the works for a couple of years now, and uh, it was actually because of international outcry that it's, that it's kind of taken so long, it kind of keeps coming back and surges and then kind of retreats again. 
but it's because the international community spoke out to it. Um, Uganda is not the first state to criminalize homosexuality in this way. It's not the only state that um, homosexuality has a death penalty sentence tied to it. Um, but what's notable to me in this case is when this legislation came forward in an unprecedented way from when other states passed such legislation, the international community said, this, this will not stand, like we will not accept this. And this was from human rights groups, secular groups, as well as certain religious groups. Um, and that to me was quite notable. Um, the media did an excellent job of, I think, for covering this um, within Uganda, where I've done some work, and then outside as well. Um, and it did get some kind of response. Now it's also getting state response. Um, Hillary Clinton has spoken directly to um, you know, you're starting to perhaps link, uh, link aid with, with LGBT rights issues. Um, David Cameron has addressed the, the Commonwealth and, and tried to also suggest that there's other moral dilemmas that go into linking aid to, to any rights issue, but, but LGBT issues in particular, but I do think that threat out there has already put pressure on certain states to at least at least rhetorically start revisiting some of these laws and some of their policies. Um, what that actually means in implementation and practice is different. I think also what Neil said about this also being uh, you know, largely attitudinal and scapegoating, um, there's, there's a lot of work just beyond a simple policy or law in a lot of places, and, and I include the US and North America in that as well, so. Yeah, I, I'd only, uh, only add it. I, I think there's a grassroots um, issue. So I mean, there's there's obviously uh, response, you know, policy responses of, of uh, states and governments and things. But you know, I, I think when you think of globalization and you think of uh, you know one of the one of the facets of religion and globalization is that you've got uh, religious communities, denominations that exist across borders. The border simply means that it's people in a different location, but they have similar uh, similar beliefs and similar creeds. Um, so I, I think a, a part of this, uh, you know, is, is is something that can be addressed from a grassroots level of support across denominations that are that are uh, you know that can support in these ways. And I think one of the important things is that you know it doesn't have to be. Uh, you know, concern and, and care here isn't necessarily tied to religious groups that would affirm same-sex marriage. Um, when you uh, think of, you know, the, the term toleration gets bounced around a lot with uh, a lot of different, when we, you know, talk about the things that we agree on in society, uh, the term toleration gets bounced around a lot. And generally what we mean by it is decent treatment of people. Uh, well, thinking especially of Christianity, Christians actually aren't called to treat those who they disagree with decently, they're called to love them, right? It's, it's, they're called to love their neighbor. So even on an issue that would be very divisive, uh, and, and especially in, in North America, the issue of same-sex marriage is quite divisive within, uh, within religion and with Christianity, uh, you can disagree on these things fundamentally, but still recognize that for Christians, uh, if the gospel is, is the root of your uh, uh, of your faith, then you aren't called to just treat people decently, you're called actually to love your neighbor. And so there'd be space there, I think, across denominations to encourage, uh, you know, give grassroots encouragement to denominations within a place like Uganda uh, to support against in, an injustice of, of, uh, of this size. And yet, and yet, uh, Christians are hating each other <laughs> as we speak and, and being bad to each other. You know? and, um, I wanted to mention this at some point, and I'm going to now, uh, uh, to try to understand how, it, how can people be so contradictory to that key, easy, central message to Christianity and promulgate uh, hate uh, to gays, for example. Um, we're quite used to talking about personal development. A phrase that comes with that is faith development. And work's been done uh, by uh, Fowler uh, in the 1980s to look at faith development and to try and put some words to it. And uh, the sort of categories he came up with were mythic literal for the really young kids, uh, synthetic conventional for your teenager years, 
uh, individuative, reflective for the 25 to 40, um, and then uh, conjunctive and universalizing. These words take you through different stages and they, uh, they describe changes uh, within being a Christian. But uh, whole communities can rest in one particular stage. And for instance, if you're at the synthetic conventional stage or the indi individuative reflective stage, change to another stage can be very threatening. And so at work here is uh, battling to retain your sense of your own personal faith, which is under threat from other people within your own tradition uh, that are clearly not at that same point, using the same text, saying different things. And it's a more existential, what I'm saying, it's more an existential energy than um, a theological one and therein the trigger for hateful behaviour and attitudes. Thank you. Sounds like you have fans. Thanks, George. Um, I have one other question for you, Reverend Marcus. So, last week the Church of England uh, voted over allowing women to serve as bishops. Yeah. The vote failed to pass and women cannot currently become bishops in this church. It's not uncommon to have female bishops in Anglican churches, so my question is, why is there resistance in this specific church in England? And more generally, within Christianity, do you think people are becoming alienated from institutions that have more, uh, a more conservative sense? It only just failed, and it failed partly because, well, it failed because it's a complex system of three houses within the Church of England, uh, and all three have to approve by a majority of two-thirds. And the lay order of the house, the uh, nun clergy, um, vote, failed to vote just by two thirds. And so the whole thing stopped. And normally that would mean you'd wait for another five years before a vote could be taken again. But there are mechanisms within the creaking institution that you can go faster than that if there's a will. So it may come back sooner than five years. Um, it's not a healthy situation, and I think uh, people realize that. I could flip it and say I, I would hope that perhaps the Church of England could realize uh, through this tragedy in a way that it really needs to look at its structure as well as, it, as its values. Um, and certainly it doesn't attract people to, to it, but I wouldn't say it's it's because it's such a conservative institution. The Church of England is famous for including anybody. You can believe whatever you like in the Church of England, I exaggerate, but in having the uh, full range of Christian belief was a quality. In other words, um, any Christian position could be respected within that Church of England, uh, which is a an attractive thing, and yet in function, if it means that a minority, which it is, controls that institution at key points, then it has to be looked at. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Professor Norman, I have one question here towards you. I want to ask you about the role of martyrdom in the Middle East, specifically in Palestine. What is the purpose of martyrdom in the context of the ongoing conflicts, and how is it used as a political tool, and how actively is it being promoted? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, this idea of martyrdom uh, in the Israel-Palestine conflict in particular and the use of suicide bombing, I would maintain that it's very much a political action and it's couched very uh, strategically in religious terms, but it, it, to me it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite literally hijacking religion for, for a political purpose in that regard. Um, in most research that's been done on suicide bombing and those who are either recruited or likely to be recruits, um, it's, it's very similar people who would be recruited to join an army or a militant group or some other kind of, uh, of resistance, and that is generally the, the primary motivation behind it. Um, I've done interviews myself with a number of uh, not not those recruited for suicide bombings, but those who affiliate with Hamas or with Islamic Jihad. And most of these individuals are relatively secular, um, even though they're part of these parties that we associate with, with martyrdom. And again, it was, I saw it, see it as one form of what people saw as, as a form of resistance rather than, rather than a religious calling in any way. 
Um, it's important to know with Israel-Palestine too, suicide bombing didn't originate in Palestine. Um, it's not something that's inherent to that region. Um, it was used in other conflicts before. Um, and also, more importantly, it has been on a sharp decline in the last five to seven years. It really peaked in 2002, 2003, in this last, in the previous intifada. Um, but it, it did not have a lot of public support and also was not really achieving the aims that it, that it set out to do. And, and you've seen a shift in tactics. The, the rockets that were the norm in this last intensification, this last week, have been the primary form of resistance. And it's, it's because, uh, yeah, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't that commitment to the suicide bombing concept. It was a strategy that was tried and, and, and abandoned, I feel. In the short time I've been interested in human rights, I've associated with secularism. That's just how I came into it. And then this summer, I met a group of very religious, devout Christian human rights activists. So my question to you is: Are human rights and religion, and is human rights and religion um, going after the same goal? Are they working in unison? Are they after the same thing? Can they always coexist? And what overlap do you see happening? Uh, initially, my response is I don't think they are working quite for the same goals. I think that uh, religions are about explaining our existence and finding meaning and confronting mortality with some sense. Uh, there's this clear overlap then into human rights, but uh, that's not the focus. It's more uh, here we are what we make of it. Yeah, I definitely don't see the two as mutually exclusive, nor do I see them as, as exactly working towards the same. Um, I would say that faith informs rights and concept, as we've, we've talked about, and not only Christian rights, but also uh, Islam, Judaism, who's, many, many faiths have informed rights. And also I feel faiths can can motivate people to do human rights based work. And I definitely in Israel, Palestine, in my, my field work, I've definitely seen this. And I think, uh, like you, Farah, I was kind of, I was surprised that coming in with my own worldview to see how many uh, you know, very strong activists were, were coming from a faith based background to be there. And even though our work kind of looked the same on the ground, um, we had different motivations for being there. But I, I do see that as being a, a very, um, a very effective motivator for very strong human rights work in many contexts. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, religion and human rights are distinct, uh, distinct entities. Um, now, I would lean on on John Woody uh, Jr., who's a, a world-renowned scholar of religion and, and rights, uh, in recognizing he looks at, at the language of rights as being probably our, our best global language for justice. Um, and he sees human beings as being uh, kind of irretrievably religious. You know, we, we pursue, uh, you know, the, the goals and the, and the order that, that religion uh, provides, and we almost can't help but pursue those things. Um, so human rights offers to religion a space for expression, a space for practice. Uh, what religion has uh, to offer to human rights is, uh, is the birth of new forms and the birth of uh, the the encouragement uh, towards justice uh, that uh, sometimes can be lacking. So uh, I see that the two can, can certainly be intermingled and, and work together, but they are, they are distinct uh, too. I like that. The, the dynamism between the two is clearly the mm -hmm. case, uh, and it would explain why religious people end up putting their lives on the line for human rights. I got to touch on the tiniest fraction of what I wanted to discuss today, but unfortunately this concludes the moderated portion of our discussion. I'd now like to introduce you to Asha Dupriel of Amnesty McGill, who has some closing questions. And the audience is also welcome now to ask your own questions, share comments. Uh, we also have started a Reddit form on the McGill subreddit, so if you're shy, take out your laptop and type it there. Thank you. Gosh. What will the future hold? <laughs> All right, so as she said, we have a Reddit forum going on. We also have Facebook threads as well as Twitter. So there's a number of questions I have for you from students and activists alike. Um, also want to open up the floor to you guys. So I'll ask a question first from the Facebook thread and then um, open the floor. So a student asks, 
is there any way to address conflicts and fundamental beliefs when advocating for human rights without diluting those rights? For example, with debates about contraception and marriage equality, what is the best way to incorporate religious voices? A little bit of a complex question. Yes, it is. So, take it in any direction you want. Can, can you repeat it just a yeah, little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So, is there any way to address conflicts and fundamental beliefs when advocating for human rights without diluting those rights? For example, with debates about contraception and marriage equality, what is the best way to incorporate religious voices? I think there's, there's maybe another concern that's, that's hidden there too, because it's not just a matter of diluting rights, uh, but it's also a matter of what does it mean to be religious or to be a part of a religious community. And those are two things that you're, that you're trying to hold in tension uh, uh, you know, with this. So is there space to be, uh, you know, is there space to be a part of a community and to follow its creed and, and to confess the way that community confesses, uh, even if you know, that puts you in tension with some specific rights? Um, now, the, the typical way that works out is, is uh, referred to by some as the liberal dilemma, where uh, you know, in a liberal society, you create space for these groups to be themselves, and yet those groups violate specific rights of individuals within them. Uh, women's rights is, is probably historically the most typical. Um, now, it's a very difficult dilemma because uh, we like to think of our society as a small L liberal that allows for a plurality of reasonably held, comprehensive worldviews to exist together. Um, so the problem is, is when you move into, into uh, these religious communities and you start making demands of a large L liberal variety, uh, you in a sense lose the, uh, you, you almost homogenize your society, right? There's no, there isn't a space for, for maybe illiberal groups to, uh, to function in that way. Um, so, so the difficult, I mean, the difficulty here is how do you create space for these groups that as a part of their core uh, you know, might not allow for a woman to be a priest, or might have very specific views on uh, uh, on uh, marriage or or contraception or different things. Um, Alvinisa talks about inside and outside law, and uh, the I idea being, you know, for a community to live under their inside law as a community. Okay, uh, to, it's not that there's no limits to that, but within reasonable limits, which is itself, I guess, a difficult task to talk about what's reasonable. Um, so they may hold to those inside their community, uh, yet they've got to live under the law of the land outside of it. So I think the best answer I can give is there's a dance. <laughs> uh, that, that if we want to sustain this society of reasonably diverse and distinct uh, perspectives, um, there's going to have to be some kind of a dance in policy and in community, and there's going to have to be some very clear dialogue of understanding. I want to make sure we hear from people here, so I'll just be very brief. Um, I think a lot of it's where the directive is coming from, and to give to respond to the examples that you gave, especially marriage equality in the U.S. Um, if you study U.S. politics, you see the way the U.S. has dealt with it, and it's become the federal government kind of avoids it, and so that's one kind of strategy of, of allowing for debates to happen. Um, another too is again this sense of. Uh, people feeling directed to do something or not to do something. When the, the marriage equality came up in California on the ballot, um, I, I remember my, my sister's in-laws, just for anecdotal, um, you know, were like, well, this is, our church is going to have to do, you know, uh, same-sex unions now. And, and it was, it, it was this sense of people feeling like they were going to be forced, and the idea was like, no, but the state's just saying that this is a possible, your, your church can still have its own, it can do whatever it wants, but this needs to be like a, a civil law and a civil right. And so having those conversations about what we're actually talking about and making sure that people understand their own personal families, institutions, churches, what have you, can still maintain certain uh, practices even if a larger right or law is moving forward. So that's, that's one way that you see it playing out in the states right now, whether you agree with that or not. Canadian marriage law is similar on that in that it protects the religious institutions but not necessarily individuals. So the Saskatchewan marriage commissioners uh, would lose their jobs 
if they refuse to do right. a same-sex marriage, which is because they're an arm of the state, uh, whereas, you know, a, whatever church wouldn't be forced to do that. Exactly, yeah. And within the religion, you always have the question, do you continue to belong to that tradition or and, <clears throat> and live under its discipline or its, its rules or leave? And that is, uh, can be quite tough. Yeah. So I want to open up to the audience and questions. Okay, so we'll turn it to the Twitter. I'll let you guys do the thing. There's probably a lot going on. Um, okay, so on Twitter, one follower asks, how can cultural imperialism be combated to keep from scapegoating Islam? More specifically, in terms of women's rights, what is the best way to ensure that Western feminism does not encroach on the rights of Muslim women? who choose to wear the hijab or niqab, et cetera. Yeah, I'll respond to that. I, to me, what I've seen in the last 10, especially the last five years, is Muslim women have been their best advocates. And, and in the US and in North America and in Canada, um, I think that uh, there's been there's been an articulation that has challenged some of the stereotypes, um, especially around um, the hijab or, or, or um, uh, wearing a headscarf. The conversation is much richer because Muslim women themselves have have advanced that dialogue. And again, it would be cultural imperialistic to suggest that you know, the West or those of us in Western academic institutions are the ones to lead that charge. I think in this issue especially, some of us have taken a step back, but in this case, Muslim women themselves amplify that voice. And I do think that discussion has been richer. I'd direct people to Leela Abedugad's uh, essay, Do Muslim Women Really Need Saving? And it's a, it's a really interesting uh, uh, take on the issue. And, and again, it, it really uh, speaks to um, the agency of wearing the veil and, uh, and what that means. Uh, but reading that article would do you light years ahead of hearing me say anything more about it. <laughs> Yes, great. <laughs> uh, so it's actually about uh, a case that's going on in Ontario about distribution of Bibles in schools. And actually, one of the uh, part in one school where Bibles were allowed to be distributed, uh, tried to get uh, atheist uh, literature to be distributed in that school, and the school refused uh, to allow that. So my question is, should to which extent should uh, atheism have the same uh, protection, illegal protection as religious school? Say the last part of your question again. So, uh, to which extent should atheism have like the same mm -hmm. uh, kind of a okay. protection, legal protection, as religious school views? Is it yeah. a public school, I'm assuming? Yeah. It's an interesting question of what level the decision was made of uh, the school board or the area or... It's the school district. The school district. Yeah. Which, to me, is a cultural response, really, to, to the issue. Uh, they decided collectively that atheism uh, was not a, a valid as a, as a position. What's the harm? What's the harm? It's literature. We're at a school. And so, to me, this is uh, highly narrow <laughs> in the understanding of what religious education is about within, within schooling. That's where that group is coming from. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the least um, theologically oriented, I think, of the panel, but to me, a, a, like a, a, a interfaith dialogue or multi-faith uh, education would, would be lacking without having an insight to atheism and having that, that viewpoint exposed to you, um, even if one's going to be critical and reject it, but to be exposed to it and to... Uh, to be able to comment intelligibly on religious issues now, you at least need to be exposed to that, to that perspective as well. And I think the religious students in those schools are also being given disservice if not having access to, to atheist materials as well. Yeah, I mean, all, all I would maybe add to that is, I mean, Canada is a, is a culture in transition in a lot of ways because it's, it's undeniable uh, the Christian roots of our country that are 
you know, put in Latin on our shield and you know, different things, right? Uh, so there's those those roots are there, um, but you know, Canada today is much different than the Canada that produced that shield or the Canada that was you know years before that shield. Um, so there's there's probably some cultural lag in in something like that where you've had it. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, the Gideon Bible Society gave out New Testaments to all grade threes or grade fours, I think. Uh, but I mean, when I was a kid, which was that long ago, uh, I mean, we did the Lord's Prayer in school. We, uh, my grade two teacher, I remember doing devotionals. This is public school. This isn't uh, a Christian school or anything. So all that is to say is, is uh, you know, there's some, some of that is a cultural probably lag where where that's, you know, and I think you said at the level of the district, it's kind of a cultural issue. But where, where some of those things maybe traditionally have happened, you know, people are used to Bibles having been handed out, and all of a sudden they've got to deal with the question of, oh, like atheists and atheist uh, material being handed out, what do you do? And I think, you know, for, for those who want to hand the Bibles out, probably part of what they have to come to grips with is, you know, if, if they don't want the atheist material handed out, then they probably should find a different way of, of uh, you know, probably handing out their Bibles isn't the best thing to do then, because that opens up the avenue for, for everything else, right? Um, getting back to the idea of culture and religion in the intersection between the two, um, in August during the Quebec French election, there was a lot of talk about how uh, the PQ wanted to uh, ban the like, religious garmentry in the public sector except for the crucifix. And the argument was um, the crucifix is tied to Quebec culture, it's not just a religious symbol, it's a symbol of the Quebecois people. And do you think this is a legitimate argument, and to what extent can you divorce religion from culture? So the question, uh, just to, to repeat it for others, um, is in regards to the, the PQ proposal to keep the, the crucifix and that religious symbolism, but to disallow other religious symbols. Um, to me, this is a, a clear double standard, I think, trying to play the culture card, and this is part of the larger PQ, or larger Quebecois culture. Again, I'm not a native Quebecois, this is me speaking as newcomer American, but, um, but I, I think people often make the link to religion to justify certain things, and I, I think this is almost um, you know, the same thing as, as the, the last question, is if, if you're going to allow the traditional long, uh, longly accepted religious symbol or book, you need to be open to others. And if you want it to be completely secular, then you don't have any of those things in public spaces, but you can't have one and, and, and justify it just by culture. I would, I'd like to see all the religious affiliations on everybody, no problem, provided and you have to then know that the formation of someone means that they cannot uh, use a bias towards clients in any way. Uh, so. You, you safeguard against discrimination by the formation, and so you know that the, the symbol you might see has no bearing on how you might be treated. That takes work, you know, but that's the way forward, I think. Okay. So we have someone on Facebook who wants to ask a question. Yeah, this is a big question. I think Egypt's courts have other things going on this week, um, but um, but yeah, this is a big question right now in, in a lot of a lot of the Middle East and Syria right now as well. Um, uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime had kind of prided itself on uh, supporting uh, religious minorities and maintaining the support of religious minorities. So many Christians and uh, and, and uh, uh, religious minorities in Syria right now have kind of been on the fence with that uprising you saw in Egypt as well. Um, again, any kind of democratic transition, I think you'll see a, a, a mix of responses, and there there will be be some things like you just said. Um, but overall, to me, as as we've 
you know, people in Canada, people in the U.S., the, the democratic structure allows for this multitude, allows for this multiplicity. Um, in a case like Egypt, like anywhere, there will be extreme views by some, but the push of democracy, I think, will override those in the long run. Um, and there are some countries where um, religious law sort of uh, dictates what can and can't be done. And in some instances, it's definitely not that they don't address their rights, but um, leads to the banning of certain products, say, books that are other religions. Like, for example, I'm from Middle East, and I know that I wasn't taught about any other religion, especially in school. Everything else was blacked out and censored. And um, I was just wondering what do you think people can do about this? Yeah, so what can people do about, about censorship and, and learning about other religions? Um, uh, not knowing your specific context, I would say one obvious shift that we're seeing now is, is being able to access information with, with media, social media in particular, and I think groups like JHR do a great job of, of, uh, of pointing this out, that a lot of topics, whether it's religion or otherwise, that were taboo or censored in many societies, there, there are avenues now to gain access to them. Um, in terms of more concrete steps, um, again, you're seeing a lot more mobilization from human rights groups to, to ensure that there is a less censorship and then more, more opportunities for reviews, and also state pressure on other states to allow that as well. I mean, we, we talked about the LGBT issue and, and states pressuring each other on human rights norms in that regard but you're also seeing increasing state pressure for human rights norms and other things as well. And that's a progression of human rights in a very positive direction that states pressuring each other on those, uh, on those norms is becoming more common. So, so I, it's a hard question to answer, but I do see things shifting in, 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 a, in a slightly better direction. I'd say if you know the, any religious tradition in depth, you'll find an argument within it to counter censorship. I mean, probably uh, different education initiatives are, are some of the more practical, on the ground things that change. You have a group, uh, you know, different groups that, that, I mean, in Quebec we have this ERC program, but abroad you have groups like the uh, Tony Blair Faith Foundation with their face to faith programs that are working to. And some of them working, you know, working in places like Pakistan or different places to uh, help educate about different religious traditions. But but it's hard if you're in a situation where it's you know it's being firmly denied and, and, and blocked out. How do you learn? I guess a part of it is the is the desire of the individual to learn and how far they're willing to pursue. And so all those that you I mean, you know, when you look at, at human rights, I think one of my criticisms of the language of rights itself is that it is too individualistic. It's, you end up with a lot of conflicts with a rights language that grounds its justifications in the individual will. Uh, so you're always, you're, you're always uh, you know, going to bump up against things. Now, that, part of that is just the nature of justice, is that a part of justice is sorting through these things. And in fact, a part of, of democratic society is being locked in this argumentation about what is right and what isn't, and uh, um, you know. But but I think one of the things that the language of rights can learn not only from from uh, you know global neighbors, you know, if we're, we're going to look at it and say, well, okay, it is it is a very Western language. One of the things it can learn by being by attempting to universalize is this pressure from from uh, different traditions and different. Uh, uh, groups that are saying it, it can't be that intensely, uh, intensely individualistic, so it can learn from the pressure of other uh, philosophies and other traditions that are bringing to it. But it can also 
dig back into its own history, conceptual history too, uh, to, to in a sense tame down some of the highly individualistic uh, language that it, that it has today. Uh, because again, the roots of it aren't specifically an individualistic root. Uh, so, so I think there's, there's a couple of different ways. I mean, you know, one is, is a part of doing justice is just you're going to have to have some agonistic, you know, uh, approach and understand there's going to be conflict in working through that. Uh, but the other part is, is listening not only to your own roots, but also listening to the voices around you and, and uh, recognizing that maybe there's something more to learn here. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think a couple of things on it. First, just the sense of I don't, I don't feel that any, any of the rights that are in the UDHR would contradict community rights or community well-being. And I, I think that's something important to note is that just by having this set of rights does not mean that this sense of, of community duty or, or what other kind of concepts of, of, of justice or goodness you might have are particularly threatened by the rights uh, regime, as we call it. Um, I think different cultures, religions, areas, what have you, can emphasize different aspects more. So in Asia, there has been the tradition of emphasizing duty over rights, of emphasizing community over individual. But that doesn't mean that the other one is is completely moot or or you know or contradicts it at all. Um, I also think you've seen a shift. Like the the Asian values argument was was stronger back in like the 70s and 80s, but. It's, it's really cool now and, and you know link that to globalization or what but it's it's shifted and, and ASEAN the um, uh, has just started like a human rights working group and initiative in the last couple of years so so you you're seeing a shift with Asian states as well and and again you're also seeing a shift with human rights groups and actors that used to be very firmly on this kind of individual rights liberal like track that are also starting to think more creatively about what we mean by rights and look at positive rights that just by nature include more of this community sense. So, so you're kind of seeing both meet in the middle. Uh, human rights language is really quite new. Religions are really quite old. And I think within the religions, there's, there's a recognition of the struggle that, uh, between an individual and the group. And there'll be a lot within those traditions that can resource human rights language. We really are still new in, in dealing with these concepts. Um, okay, so we have a question from Reddit. Um, how and where should we draw the line between freedom of speech of groups when they advocate beliefs that infringe on other people's human rights? So the example the student provided was pro-life groups on campus. Should they be allowed to exist? And whose rights get prioritized? Uh, we'd like to note that the notion of abortion being a human right is a contested issue. However, this argument is related to maternal mortality, in particular uh, pro prohibitions on therapeutic abortion as infringing on the right to be free from cruel and humane and degraded treatment. Coming from the states, the idea that you would not have pro-life groups on campus is pretty unthinkable. Like That's just a given that you would have that viewpoint there. Um, and again, I mean, the nature of free speech is that you have those voices, but everyone else has the right, and I would also say the duty in some in some cases uh, to respond to it and and to 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 whether it's pro life or, or something else. If your belief or faith system or right system is different than that, then you have that right in that space then to to also have a voice to that. Um, I was about to say something else to it too, and I can't remember. Oh yeah, the um, the the American document that I mentioned before, the 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 America's Human Rights Document. The reason that Canada is not a party to that mainly is because its language on right to life is very specific, um, and because it was written largely by Latin American countries that are largely Catholic and, and are uh, very pro life. Uh, that language is stronger and seen as, as a human right in that regard to protect pro-life interests, and that's one reason that Canada does not sign on to that document. So, just a side note there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, uh, you know, if you have a situation where, uh, you know, deep liberal values of freedom, you know, that, that are, you know, part of what sustains, uh, has sustained the argument for uh, abortion were to silence a group that's against. It. I mean, it's it doesn't get much more illiberal than saying, "Oh, you have an opinion? Please don't share. It. Please don't share it. Don't say anything. Uh, we don't want to hear it." You know, I mean, G.S. Mill would roll over in his grave thinking about, you know, that we're talking about a democracy where you can't voice 
some idea that you have. So, uh, you know, democracy is meant to be this commerce of ideas. Um, so that, that would, and that would, especially in a university, uh, that would seem like uh, quite a ludicrous idea. Now, I know there's, in the past, in McGill, especially, there's this, that very specific issue, there's been tension around that. Uh, I think I've seen a YouTube video of a pro-life group meeting disrupted by, by a group of students, you know, speaking over the speaker so that they couldn't talk. But there's a real irony to that in, in the idea of, of the university. Uh, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. I picked that phrase up a, a few decades ago. Eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. So, yes, but it certainly means that the, the discussions have to be animated and uh, you have to participate in, in the forum of uh, different ideas, especially when they're ones that uh, you strongly disagree with. Um, yeah, actually, Asia in the past, uh, well, actually adopted about two weeks ago, uh, the, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. And so I was wondering, because a lot of critics were saying that, well, it was legitimating like the, the different governments there, because obviously it was very restricted, whereas other groups were um, saying that it was actually like, some good developments and positive development. So I was just wondering, uh, yeah, it's not that much related to, to uh, debate, but I was just wondering how uh, what is your position on that? Is it legitimating um, despotic regimes, or is it actually like a good development? Um, I haven't looked at the ASEAN document itself, but a number of the regional documents uh, do differ, and it's it, the regional documents have kind of a they're a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they allow for this cultural and sometimes religious variation, but at the same time, they sometimes allow for. Um, uh, for rights violations, that so you always have to look and see what rights are not included or which ones are added, and see where the differences are. Um, to me, the fact that ASEAN is is at least making a move towards towards having a human rights document is a positive step, and it it contributes to just that culture of human rights that I think faith groups and secular groups are hoping that that we move towards. All right. So on behalf of Chief Charlie. Uh, and also thank you to students sending in their questions via Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, follow us. Um, yeah, and that concludes it. The, you guys can discuss and have refreshments and thank you to the wonderful Farah who had Thank you all for coming. Um, we actually discussion. have a bit of a room emergency. There is a booking problem as usual here. So we need to get going quickly, but please eat my cupcakes with my baseball. Oh, <laughs> thank you.